This video is going to be a little bit longer because it's going to tackle this last part of the neuroscience and behavior unit. It's all going to be about ethology. We're just going to define ethology and what it is and how it's relevant. And then based on the syllabus, there are several examples of ethology, specific examples of studying animal behavior that we're going to go through. These are all applications of ethology. So what exactly is ethology? We're looking at animal behavior and the evolution of animal behavior. Ethology is the study of animal behavior in natural conditions. For natural human conditions, for example, studying why humans sing in the shower. Something I love to do. It's a fantastic behavior. Natural selection can change the frequency of behavior. So this is a rather important concept because we're linking animal behaviors and the evolution of animal behaviors to gene frequency and allele frequencies. If those behaviors, if certain behaviors are programmed in genes and they can increase the chance of survival, then we would expect these behaviors to be more present in future generations as well too. So a change in the innate behavior, keyword here is innate, meaning a behavior that's kind of built in to the actual genes. It's not an environmentally learned behavior, so it's innate and it can therefore be passed on. So changes in innate behaviors depend on the frequency of alleles that cause that particular behavior. A learned behavior, on the other hand, is something that can be lost more quickly because it is passed on without a change in alleles. So in essence, if a monkey teaches another monkey something and this monkey tries to mimic the actual actions, if that particular monkey dies out without having taught that trick to another monkey, then it's possible that that behavior could just disappear from this particular monkey generation. So learned behaviors can spread or be lost more quickly because they're passed on without an actual change in alleles. And from here on out, we're going to be looking at specific examples of animal behavior. One of our first examples of animal behavior that we're going to look at are these little birds here. They're called black caps and we're going to be talking about their migration habits. So if you look down at this little map here, this longer arrow heading down from Germany towards Spain, they tend to breed in the summer and then during the winter they migrate to warmer areas. So this path is the normal path that they usually take down here. We understand that migration has a genetic basis. So it's not a learned behavior that the birds are kind of picking up from each other, even though they fly in flocks, basically. But there is a genetic component to it. So for any bird to fly the wrong direction, that has to be the result of some kind of mutation or variation. So basically what has been noticed uh, based on the data is that a lot of these birds, a few of these birds are now flying a little bit north and they're going towards the UK and that could be possible uh, could be due to warmer global temperatures access to food and you can think that under normal circumstances if a bird started going this way and it wasn't a successful path then that bird would have died off wouldn't have made it back uh, wouldn't have made the round trip migration journey and then that behavior would have stopped but in this particular case due to natural selection even though that difference existed that difference still yielded a successful behavior a successful genetic trait that has arisen and so more reproduction happen that trait gets passed on and so there's still birds that are moving migrating to both places experiments have followed up with this data and shown that this is something that is continuously observed now we're on to one of my favorite stories of animal behavior these cute little guys these little suckers these little blood suckers these little vampire bats i'm um, sorry got really excited there talking about these guys blood sharing in vampire bats is a fantastic story they go out and they suck blood from larger animals at night they live in groups those that fail to feed two nights in a row may die so that sucks so they have to be constantly there sucking blood sorry i'm using the word sucks a lot but here's one really interesting thing if there are bats that have been more successful at actually picking up blood they will actually give blood to other bats that were less successful with feeding, literally by regurgitating. If you don't know what that word means, it means vomiting up and then spitting it into the mouth of another bat that didn't get enough because they need this stuff to stay alive. They're literally little vampire bats. 
Why would they do that if it would limit their chance of surviving by giving up their own food? It's because they remember it's something called reciprocal altruism. Now, the bat that donates blood might need some blood in the future, and that can actually be returned as a favor. So you thought that humans were the only ones who understood the idea of cheat and deceit or returning favors, paying it forward. Vampire bats also do it too. It's awesome. Think twice next time before you start dissing vampire bats. And one final quick example in this video. There's still a few more we got to talk about but for this one. This one's very short. Check out these crabs here. Crabs are awesome and they like to eat things by actually breaking open little muscles. So the thing about these crabs is it takes some time and energy for them to actually break open these muscles. And the bigger they are, the more work you got to put in. The smaller they are, they're easier to open, but the prize is smaller. So the basic story here that's been observed from ethologists and scientists studying these crabs is that these crabs tend to go for mid-sized muscles. It gives the perfect balance of the amount of energy I got to put in and the prize that I get at the end. For example, for me, what do I hate doing? Let's see. I hate peeling shrimp. I love eating the shrimp, but the amount of time I spend peeling the shrimp sometimes is just not worth the shrimp prize that I get at the end. So I'm not too into it. But for a lobster, actually, this is not a good idea. I guess the lobster meat tastes good, but it's a little bit larger. So I'm more willing to put time into a larger lobster because the prize meat at the end is really, really good. And I'm not a blood sharing vampire bat. So that's the idea. They tend to go for mid-sized muscles is basically what it is. So in bullet points, they forage. Foraging is the fancy word for searching for food. They increase their chance of survival by choosing their prey choice optimally. In this case, it's intermediate sized muscles. So crabs like to eat intermediate sized muscles. It's the best energy yield per time spent opening the shell. So that just means for the energy that they actually spend to open the shell and the prize and the energy that can be derived from the food that they eat, it's the best balance. Too small, it's not enough energy that they can be gained from the prize. Too big, and they're spending way too much energy trying to crack these things open, um, even though the prize is a lot bigger. So the intermediate size is the best. All right, there are, I think, five more examples that we need to go through in terms of applications of ethology. So I'm going to continue this in the next video.